Most animals live relatively solitary lives, occasionally meeting up only to copulate, threaten, or fight with each other. But some species live in groups where they constantly interact. An important question in Evo Psych is, what benefits do individual organisms gain from living in social groups? According to evolutionist Richard Alexander, complex sociality should be expected to arise only when confluences of interest produce benefits that override the costs of conflicting interests. He believes animal social behavior emerges from the need for cooperative defense and the production of mutual offspring. So do we humans thrive in the company of others for the same reasons as other social animals? Here is an example of research involving social network analysis applied to cooperation patterns of a hunter-gatherer tribe, the Hadza. I spent the summer of 2010 traveling around remote regions of Lake Ayasi in northern Tanzania with the Hadza for one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer populations on the planet. And my goal was to explore the origins of human social networks and the evolution of cooperation. The hunter-gatherer lifestyle predates agriculture, villages, and even domesticated animals. Isolated from modern cultural influences, the Hadza essentially live as our ancestors did tens of thousands of years ago, roaming rugged terrain and forming temporary camps along the way. Their lives offer us a window into our past and clues about the evolution of cooperation. For the Hadza, cooperation is the key to survival. These welcoming, resilient people share almost everything, food, labor, childcare, which raises the question, are there some people who are just looking for a free ride in the community? The free riders would be expected to garner more resources than altruists. Eventually, their behavior would unravel the social fabric. Do the Hadza have a mechanism to keep this from occurring? Social network experts Nicholas Christakis here at Harvard Medical School and James Fowler from the University of California in San Diego helped me design a study to answer these and other questions. Specifically, we designed exercises to measure social ties and cooperation. Over the course of several months, I visited 17 different Hadza camps which was no easy feat. The terrain was a challenge and it was often difficult to find the camps because the Hadza are nomadic. They move every four to six weeks. The Hadza don't own things so they don't have to stay in one place. And camp membership is also fluid. If an individual is unhappy with a particular group, he or she can move to a different one. I was greeted warmly at each camp where I found many adults, 205 in all, eager to take part in our study. I showed each participant photos of 517 adult Hadza that were collected during past research with the community. I asked, who would you like to live with after this camp ends? We also used games with honey, a favorite food of the Hadza, to shed light on ties in the community. For example, one game allowed us to measure the tendency of particular individuals to cooperate. Each participant decided how to distribute four sticks of honey after listening to the rules. When we mapped individual traits with social ties, the results were astounding. Cooperators cluster together. They become friends with other cooperators, which keep self-interested individuals from dragging them down. And what's more, the architecture of the Hadza social network matches that of modern social networks. These findings provide crucial insight into the evolution of cooperation and altruism in humans and suggest that social networks have been a fundamental part of human life since ancient times. It is a common feature of our species that we frequently show kindness to those with whom we share no genes by common descent. We have all heard stories of soldiers laying down their lives to save their comrades in battle, and there are many well-documented examples of individuals diving into dangerous waters to save the lives of non-relatives. In many countries throughout the world, blood is given freely to be dispensed to complete strangers, and the giving of money to charity is not considered abnormal in any known society. If natural selection promotes genetic selfishness, then why do humans engage in self-sacrificing behavior towards non-relatives. Has free will developed in our species as an emergent property of the brain, propelling us beyond our genetic imperative 
and into acts of true altruism. Can evolutionary theories ever fully explain such behavior? There are examples of apparent self-sacrificing behavior which occur outside the family context, shown on the table. All the examples given in this paper were published after Trivers' 1971 classic theoretical paper. According to Trivers, the evolution of reciprocal altruism in an animal society relies on a number of prerequisites. The cost of the altruistic act to the actor should be lower than the benefit to the recipient. Animals should be capable of recognizing each other in order to both reciprocate and to detect cheats, the non-reciprocators. Animals should have a reasonably long lifespan so they can repeatedly encounter specific individuals and thereby allow for incidents of reciprocation to occur. The dolphins, primates, bats, and social birds that are detailed in the table clearly fit Trevor's prerequisites. In recent years, given that the aid is returned, Many researchers have begun to replace the term reciprocal altruism with direct reciprocation, or simply reciprocation or reciprocity. This terminology conveniently avoids arguments about whether the behavior is really altruistic. This alone, however, does not prove that this is what is occurring in all these cases. As Cambridge University zoologist Tim Clutton Brock has pointed out, there are at least two other ways of explaining the giving of aid to non-relatives. Mutualism and manipulation. For reciprocation to occur, the assistance has to have net costs at the time that it is provided, which are offset by subsequent benefits, getting paid back later. In contrast, in the case of mutualism and manipulation, the benefits of assistance exceed the costs involved at the time that it is provided. In the case of mutualism, both individuals benefit from cooperation at the time of the act such as cooperative hunting in wolves, and hence there is no immediate cost-benefit asymmetry that is later repaid. Note that given there is no delay, there is no opportunity to cheat or freeload. For manipulation, one individual, such as a dominant conspecific, may coerce another into providing aid, and once again, there is no reciprocity. Alternatively, a non-dominant conspecific might simply be so persistent in its calls for aid that the actor succumbs in order to escape the constant begging behavior. This explanation has been suggested for the case of blood sharing in vampire bats. We can ask two questions about reciprocity in the animal kingdom. First, does it exist? And second, how common is it? Direct reciprocation would necessitate evidence that the same individuals repeatedly assist each other, that the frequency of assistance given reflects the frequency of assistance received, and finally, that there are immediate costs to the actor that are later recouped from the initial beneficiary. While most animal behaviorists would agree that direct reciprocation does exist in the animal kingdom, among primates and especially Homo sapiens, it is a very complex behavior that seems likely to be rare among other animals. Trivers suggests that reciprocity is likely to have played an important role in hominid evolution. He bases this conclusion on a number of arguments. First, all existent societies fulfill the three prerequisites he laid out. Second, humans throughout the world have been observed to give aid to friends in a reciprocated manner. And third, the emotional system that we have developed may play an important role in cooperation. In Trivers' own words, we routinely share food, we help the sick, the wounded, and the very young. We routinely share our tools, and we share our knowledge in very complex ways. Often these forms of behavior meet the criterion of small cost to the giver and great benefit to the recipient. Although kinship often mediates many of these acts, it never appears to be a prerequisite. Such aid is often extended in full knowledge that the recipient is only distantly related. When you make sacrifices in your dealings with other people, do you tend to have the expectation that your action will yield a reward? Do you have a more abstract sense of the reward, such as karma? Do you genuinely expect no reward, or perhaps do you simply not think about it? The idea that people engage in self-sacrificing acts because they are likely to benefit themselves has been criticized by a number of social scientists. One area of criticism lies in blood donation. Peter Singer has argued that blood donation is a form of pure altruism because the donor does not normally meet the recipient and cannot therefore anticipate repayment. Such acts are certainly not easily explained by Trevor's original definition of reciprocal altruism, nor by Hamilton's definition of kin altruism either. 
So do we have to accept that blood donation is a form of true altruism that transcends evolutionary considerations? Perhaps it is, but Richard Alexander suggests that rather than the donor being repaid directly by the recipient, by impressing others with their apparent self-sacrificing behavior, they may be more likely to cooperate with them in the future. In this way, humans may have extended reciprocal altruism into more complex multi-party relationships than other species. Although Alexander has addressed Singer's blood donation argument directly, he is making a more general point. That is, we may have evolved psychological mechanisms that make minor good deeds feel rewarding especially when they are observed by others. Such a state of mind may have had fitness benefits to our ancestors. Alexander's explanation does not disprove the pure altruism argument, but it does, as John Alcock has pointed out, lead to testable predictions. The experimental test being that people who engage in acts such as blood donation will generally ensure that others find out about their actions. In support of this prediction, Bobby Lowe and Joel Heinen of the University of Michigan report that people are significantly more likely to contribute to fundraising drives if they receive a badge to demonstrate their involvement. Perhaps when we wear blood donation badges or AIDS sympathy ribbons today, we are reflecting behaviors that helped our ancestors to attract cooperation from others.